following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So we're going to be talking about this concept, intelligence. It's a word that we use very often in our normal day-to-day -day world. But I'm going to invite you to take a fresh look at what intelligence really is. What is it in and of itself? Can we perceive intelligence? Can we sense it? Can we take a moment, even at this moment right now, and reflect on what intelligence is itself? Take a moment, look into yourself. What, what is intelligence? What arises when we put this uh, word or this concept in our mind? Intelligence itself. It's difficult. It's an abstract word. We say, we say that things, someone is intelligent. Someone has intelligence. Usually the way this word is... Uh, used today is, is not the way that we're going to use it today. And we would say that the way it's normally used is, isn't correct, it isn't right. We mistake intelligence for the intellect, or for being intellectual. Or we mistake intelligence for having a good memory, or being well-educated, or being able to recall many facts. But none of those things actually point or direct, to, direct one towards intelligence itself. You may have not a lot of intelligence, but be very well learned and educated. Does it mean that the intelligence is active, present, free, liberated? So it might, it might sound strange, but you don't need a lot of, of this intelligence that I'm pointing towards in order to be very good uh, on a trivia game show. You don't need a lot of intelligence in its primordial aspect in order to become a doctor or a researcher or a scientist. Of course, if you have that, then all the better. But just the bare minimum of what society wants or what society deems is not the real intelligence. It's learning. It's having a good memory. It's being able to rationalize and compare and to deduce through an intellectual process. So the whole notion of the IQ or intelligent quotient is a bit wrong. It's more of an intellectual measurement. And as the title of our lecture suggests, Intelligence and Mechanicity, the second thing we're going to talk about is mechanicity. So how do these two things relate to each other? 
Mechanicity is the other endpoint, the opposite of what intelligence is. Mechanicity is something that is confined to a certain pattern, confined according to certain rules or laws or other external pressures. So in these studies, we relate a lot with uh, Kabbalah, the tree of life. And this word intelligence is very important. It relates with one of the sephiroth of the tree of life in Kabbalah. So there are 10 sephiroth in the tree of life. The third one is called Binah which is often translated as intelligence. What this Sephiroth is, uh, what the content related to the Sephiroth is, is something to do with taking all the possibilities and making something out of it. Something that's potential possible, and making something out of it, creating something, creation. So this is the Sephiroth, Binah, which is most heavily uh, related to Genesis, to creation. All the Sephiroth are, but we talk about this one a lot because a lot is going on here. This is where this potential is coming together and creating. This has to do with the whole universe, the creation of the universe. It also has to do with us, not just physically, but us as a soul and us as a spirit as well. So we have intelligence. We possess that. We uh, arrive out of that. But what we find when we try to do something when we try to act, we can't seem to get to that pure intelligence which has all the possibilities and just do what we want to do. We have a problem in life. We want to accomplish the solution to that problem. We want to move forward. We want to do something with our life. And what happens? Immediately there's obstacles. Or we achieve something and we get it and it's not actually what we really wanted. Or something's different. Or we become jaded by the experience. We get what we want, and then it's not actually what we want, because we were mistaken. So, bina, or intelligence, is not just about creating. It's about, the, it's about the capacity to see into the possibilities, and to discern all the possibilities out of that potential. Because in the beginning, before anything's created, there's only the potential of that creation. And you, the capacity, that divine capacity, sees into that, into that uncreated world, that uncreated energy, whatever you want to call it, and sees the possibilities in it. It has that intelligence. It doesn't have to rationalize. This is not a rational thing. It sees it. It's a natural capacity that we have. So... What does that mean, a natural capacity or innate capacity? We have an innate capacity to perceive, to cognize, to apprehend, to see. And again, I don't just mean physically. I mean mentally, emotionally. To see something. We have that. We don't have to try to have it. If we close our eyes, we get mental images. If we fall asleep, we have dreams. So there is an innate capacity that we have as a soul to perceive. And as a second part of that, there is a capacity to discern. To perceive and to discern. These are two interwoven capacities that we have naturally. Because to perceive is one thing, but then to discern means that these things are different. Does that make sense? 
they're highly interrelated. Because to perceive is almost the same side of that coin. But these three sephiroth up here, these three atomic principles that are within us, are our, our core essence, the being of our own being. They have very abstract qualities that are all interrelated with each other. So we have the, the root luminosity, which is related to hokmah, the capacity to see. And we have this root intelligence, which is the capacity to discern and make out those possibilities into reality. That's what intelligence really is. But what do, what do we have? We have things that are the shadow of that. We have an intellect, which sort of has this capacity of choosing, of discerning, of making out the difference between two things. But we're going to see what the difference is. So intelligence is related to the third Sephiroth of the Tree of Life. One, two, three. So we call it the third Logos. The third Logos is the Holy Spirit. So Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's the same trinity. And the Holy Spirit is that third aspect, which contains all three aspects in, in it, but it also polarizes into a feminine aspect. So there's a trinity of masculinity and a trinity of femininity that unite in order to create everything. These are abstract principles, right? What this relates to is something within us. This is not just something that happened a long time ago or something far away from us. It happened, it's, it's here and now within us. And within us is our inner being, is our spirit. And within us is that feminine principle as well, which we call the Divine Mother. We put a name on it, Divine Mother, and we can put a symbol such as Durga or any of the feminine principles that you find in religion. And Durga here is very nice because she, this picture here exemplifies a lot of the symbolism because she's riding on a tiger. So she's on top of that tiger. The tiger can mean different things or the lion can mean different things. That lion represents the power or the law of the universe. It also represents a self-realized being, a master soul, a great soul that unites with their divine mother, unites with their inner intelligence. So when we learn, when we, if we were to self-realize ourselves, we can become a lion, a lion's cub. And we are directed by that intelligence, which is, in this picture, the Divine Mother. And she has very many properties. Some of these properties are related to wisdom and to the word, such as the, the, the shell, the conch shell, which re represents the vibration, that core energy that irradiates out. We say the word or the logos, or the sound, the great sound, the intelligent sound. The trident, which represents three forces. She holds a sword, which that sword that sword she holds in that hand over there is how she cuts through. It has that discriminating intelligence. To cut through the fog. Imagine if we presented with a problem in our lives, we were able to use a psychological tool, a tool of our soul, to cut straight through the fog, through the darkness, and see exactly what we need to see. Well, we have that. We have that. But we don't know how to use it. We don't know how to work with that. That's what that, that sword really represents. That lotus flower she holds, which is not fully blossomed yet, represents the potential. Every lotus arises from the mud. 
It's very poetic to say that every flower arises out of the dirty earth, out of the mud. Psychologically, we are that. We have a lot of darkness within ourselves. But the mud, or that darkness within ourselves, is actually the place where the flower finds the nutrients from. That's how nature works, right? So we, have the, we actually have fertile soil within ourselves. But if, you, if you've ever worked with, with the earth, with gardening, you know that fertile soil doesn't smell very good often. It smells like rottenness sometimes. But that type of soil actually is the, sometimes the best for the growth of a flower bed or fruits. There's a great mystery there. Even though we have darkness within ourselves, it doesn't mean that we're lost or hopeless necessarily. It means that that's what we have, but we have the nutrients or we have the vitamins, the, the solar values that can cause that blossoming of our soul. That, that lotus flower represents the, the possibility of our soul to blossom. Which also has a club, which is a symbol of willpower as well to defeat enemies, to defeat our own psychological enemies, which is our self. Sometimes we need a blunt force as well. So all of these things, this is a very highly symbolic, and we could talk lecture after lecture after lecture just on this, and we, there are many lectures just on that. But what is the, the content of this lecture is to see how something so beautiful and so powerful, which at this level of intelligence has a capacity of total freedom to create, that capacity gets mechanized. That capacity submits itself to what we call laws. More and more and more laws. Creation concretizes, creation crystallizes into denser and denser realities, right? So the Divine Mother, an aspect of that Divine Mother has to go down to create these denser realities, this world. A part of that Divine Mother is the intelligence which creates our physical body. Part of that Divine Mother's intelligence is encoded as our DNA and as our molecular structures and as the instructions that create our proteins which cause all of the activity to occur in our body. All the basic fundamental um, organic building blocks, the biological building blocks of this machine called the physical body is an encoded intelligence. Something that's related to our DNA, but there's more. It's not just a, mo a molecular sh string. It's not just the DNA, but a part of it is. Well, what happens when you eat some food and it goes into your stomach, the stomach digests it and a miraculous process occurs that transforms that into, into energy, into fuel for our body. Who's the one doing that? Are we doing it? Are we digesting our food? Are we pumping the blood in our heart? Who's, who's operating this machine? Supposedly it's our body, but we don't have any cognizance of any of that. We don't know what's going on with that. We pay attention to ourselves. If we become mindful, we learn how to listen to the intelligence in our body, right? We learn, I shouldn't eat that type of food, even though I really want it. My desires actually lead me to being unhealthy. I shouldn't do that, but I, I need to listen to my body. Oh, if you, if you become more aware of your, what your body needs, you know that you should, shouldn't just eat whatever your desires want. You should eat what your body needs variety of different types of healthy foods. So she, this intelligence, it's all at the very top and it's all, all the way down into or even to our physical body. Different aspects of the Divine Mother. But she's this intelligence. She's this primordial, primordial beauty. But she, which is this total expression of freedom and potentiality, submits herself to becoming mechanized, becoming confined. She does this for a purpose. It's done for a purpose. But nevertheless, it's something very brutal, almost. 
You can find uh, symbols of this in uh, various mythologies, different ways in which the Divine Mother or the soul becomes trapped in hell. That's related to different levels, different ways in which something that divine intelligence becomes trapped in, in the inferno or in this heaviness. And the beauty of the divine mother becomes disfigured because she's confined. So there's this um, process which occurs in which the divine intelligence becomes mechanized. And that's what we're going to talk about. How does the divine intelligence, which is infinite possibilities, how, how does that process then end up with something that's a mechanical, mechanized world? Sometimes in... Uh, Hermeticism or occultism or in various esoteric philosophies, they talk about the microcosmos and the macrocosmos. The microcosmos being us, a physical reality, our soul, and the macrocosmos being the universe, the large cosmos, the large creation. And that there's a, a relationship there. That what happens in the infinite something analogous transpires within us. And things that transpire within us, within our soul, within our psychological struggle, also transpires within the infinite. And this is true. But there's a bit, it's, it's a bit of an incomplete teaching. There's actually, we can, we can break up that into actually seven cosmos. Cosmos is. So the question is, the first thing you might ask is why? What does this have to do with any of my experience? Why, do I, why should I even, even care about this? Well, we talked about in, in some prior lectures why it would be important. It's important because we have an opportunity. We're here right now in our physical body, alive. Hopefully present. Something happened to put us in this space. Not just here listening to this lecture, but in this life. Some series of events occurred to put us in this life. Now, if you believe that you didn't exist before your physical body, then really, you shouldn't have any concern of what happens when you die either. Right? Because if you believe that you were created with this physical body, then when your physical body dies, you're, that's it. You're done. Actually, I think... Most people are trying to adopt this philosophy, if not totally adopting it. It's a very convenient way of just doing whatever you want with your life. Kind of being tired of being told what to do, or not find any substance in a spiritual or religious teaching, so they just throw the whole thing out. But if you're, if you're looking at these kind of teachings, probably have some kind of yearning. What... What, what is going to happen? What is this? How did I get in this place? What is my situation? The situation is we have this connection to this inner divinity, but we're lost in a maze. We really don't know how to get out. But there's a way. There's a map. Part of this map, we kind of outline it like this. All these Sephiroth. This is really, on this slide, the seven cosmos is an outline of the whole tree of life. Which is what they study in Kabbalah. So the, the tree of life is a map. It's a map of all the cosmoses. So it's a map of us as a physical body, but it's also a map of the various ways that this energy gets complicated and unfolds. If you've ever seen a waterfall where the river falls and then there's, there's a waterfall and there's another waterfall and there's another waterfall and the water keeps descending, right? Similarly, the energy has different levels. 
and goes down, descends downward. In the beginning, there's one law, which is this divine unified law. It's abstract, has not, has, is not related to any reality that we have, any conception. It's totally an abstract, absolute space. So that's called one, one primordial law, the, the unifying universal law. A law unto itself that wants to know itself. That's related to in what the Kabbalah, Kabbalists call the Ein Sof Aur. We have, we have these principles inside of us, but they're very far removed from our day-to-day -day experience, although they are right here. They're not far away. It's just our condition prevents us from directly experiencing it. But that one law creates. In order to create, it goes into creation. So creation, any type of movement, right? Any activity, any phenomenon that we have, you instantly have three aspects to it. So if I move my hand, from left to right, there's a part of it which activated that hand. It was a positive principle. There's a negation of where it was, right, where it's going to. And the synthesis is the actual hand moving, right? So you can, any phenomenon is instantly divided into at least three components which are interrelated, and that's that trinity, these three forces. So in the beginning, the abstract absolute space creates a pure cosmos of three laws, the three primary forces that it takes to create everything else. But this really isn't creation yet because you need the three forces to create something. The three forces themselves is a still very abstract thing. The three forces are in creation, right? The three forces themselves, uh, what, is it, what is it outside of creation? So, <clears throat> if I want to do anything in the world, if I want to create anything, if I want to complete a project, the first thing that happens is I have, I have an impulse to, to do it, you know, mentally. Doesn't mean it's created yet, but there's an impulse, right? Then I start planning it, laying things out and uh, experiencing the resistance to it. And only if the impulse overcomes the resistance, all the, all the obstacles it takes to complete this project, then you actually get the creation. If I want to buy a house, first I have to have the impulse to buy the house, then I have to overcome all the things that it takes to buy the house in order to actually buy the house. Any project in life has that. So those are the three primary forces. Those three primary forces are what come together in order to put our spirit and our soul into creation. So we instantaneously go from one law to three. So in this world of the Io cosmos, which is the first cosmos, it's complete freedom. So we go from an abstract world, which is still complete freedom, to a more realized, concretized world, but it's only of three laws, but it's, it's still very freedom. It's still a lot of freedom. There's still freedom there, even though it's we're one step closer to creation. Well, now those three laws come together again, successively and success, uh, more successively, to create more and more worlds. So the Eo cosmos is related to Keter, Hokmah, and Binah. And outside, it is related to the culmination of all of the suns and planets and the whole of creation. The next level is a world of six laws. So why is it six? This is something mathematical, because the world of six laws is another creation. 
Right? So if you're building something, you have the foundation, and then you have different things that rest on top of that. So this second cosmos, which is a cosmos related to any particular galaxy, so our whole Milky Way, we would say, would be an ordering of six laws. The whole galaxy, six laws. So that's what we call the macrocosmos. In order for that to occur, there has to be another application of those three forces to create another organization. So that's where we get the three from the AO cosmos plus another three to make the macrocosmos. And we continually successfully go down this, this tree of life. So after the macrocosmos is the deuterocosmos, which we go from the whole galaxy to the whole solar system. So there's many solar systems in the galaxy, right? So each one of those solar systems is a system into itself. So there's another level of creation in there. That's, really, that's related to 12 laws. But every solar system has what? Planets. So you can see how the solar system is an organization, but every planet is also another level of organization. Do you understand that, right? So one thing is an organ of our body, like the heart. Another thing is the cells that make up the heart. They're two separate things. You could look at the heart and just look at what's happening in the cell. There's all sorts of things in there. But the heart is made up of cells. And the body's made up of organs, right? These are different layers. So what happens, so you can see what happens at the cellular level is has a relationship to the heart, and the heart has a relationship to the body. So you see that cell, what influences that cell? Well, the heart, the nature of the heart does itself. What influences the heart? Well, a whole other set of conditions related to the physical body. What, and what influences the physical body? Well, the environment of the planet. And what conditions the, the, the planet is in? Well, that has a relationship with the solar system. So you see, the further down you go, you have these levels of organization that exist in larger levels of organization. So as you create more, you are impacted by more laws. This word law, don't get stuck on this. This is a philosophical term. It's a mathematical relationship. Just as that, that cell has more laws related to it because there's more conditions. It is related to the heart and the heart's related to the body. So in the same way, the planet is related to the solar system. The planet has some level of autonomy in its own conditions in and of itself. But it also is very heavily influenced by the solar system itself, by the nature of the sun and the other planets, right? So then, of course, on the planet, there's another level of creation, which we call the human organism. And by now, the Deuterocosmos has 12 laws. And then, in order to make another creation, you have to go to 24 laws. And in order to make another creation, you get to 48 laws. So we can say that us as a human organism, we are impelled by 48 laws because we're a physical body that lives on a planet that exists in a solar system that exists in a galaxy. Okay, so this isn't, this isn't something you just need to believe in. This is just a mathematical way of organizing what are the, what's, what's my condition? Samuel Unveor writes, uh, Mechanicity starts within the third cosmos because these three primordial laws divide themselves in order to become six laws. So we talked about that. The three laws becoming the six. He says, Mechanicity starts at six, going down. Because the three laws are those three primary forces. Like I said, any action, action and repose, movement and the negation of that movement, and the synthesis of those two things together, that creates a phenomenon. That's the pure movement, that's pure reality. But then, to organize that, you put a, a, like a membrane around that and you create something using those laws. You've, you've just introduced mechanicity. Mechanicity in the macrocosmos, so in a physical world that's related to our galaxy, but there's another relationship here 
The macrocosmos is related to Hesed, Geberah, and Tifereth, which from other lectures we know is related to our spirit, to our monad, and to our soul as well, the highest parts of our soul. Well, our spirit, the center of gravity of our spirit is heaven or nirvana, whatever you want to call it. So what is, if, you, if you understand that, you would read this and say that mechanicity starts within nirvana. So even in nirvana, there is the beginning of mechanicity. Even, with, even within heaven, there is some level of mechanicity. The difference between 6 and 48 is quite great, though. We experience a lot more mechanicity. So if we were to experience the world of six laws, that would be like having a mystical experience, an experience in nirvana, an experience in heaven. And that's possible. We can liberate ourselves from the 48 laws and have an experience in the world of six laws. We can have an experience in the world of three laws. The world of six laws is where the first aspect of individuality occurs. So what I said before, that intelligence has the capacity to see the, all, the, all the possibilities, difference, to have the possibility of difference, because the one law is all universal. Three laws is still, there's universal aspect there. The individuality of our own individual spirit or monad happens at six laws. The interface between three and six laws. You can have an experience in the world of three laws. That's an experience beyond your individual spirit. That would be an experience of you would be experiencing cosmic consciousness, the consciousness which we all share. You would be cognizant in experiencing the very predicate of experience itself. And since we all share that, that's a capacity to see into the experience of anyone. So in that, in that world, because everybody is one in that world, if you are fully present and cognizant in that world, you can see into any monad, into any spirit, into anybody. Again, that's possible. Why would we do that? That would be for our own self-knowledge. But the beings that live at that level have that capacity. So, this energy descends. The world of our spirit is related to six laws. The world of our, the, our soul has a relationship to six laws, 12 laws, 24 laws, and 48 laws. So our physical body is related to 48 laws. Our emotions are related to Hod, which is the world of 24 laws. Our intellect is related to Netzach, which is 12 laws. So what, what does that mean? That means we have more freedom with our emotions and our intellect than we do with our physical body. We can think very profound, abstract things that we can never, never see physically, right? Great philosophers can peer into realities which they never actually experience because they're using their intellect in a way. Now, you could use your intellect good or bad. It doesn't mean that just because you think something that it's truth. But it has that capacity. Same way with the emotional world of 24 laws. Emotions can bring us to the heights of mystical experience. But mostly, our emotions are not vibrating with 24 laws. And are mostly, almost always, our intellect is not vibrating with 12 laws. It's actually vibrating between 96 and 864 laws. So when I talked about in the beginning of this lecture about wanting to solve our problems, and we have that heaviness, we want to solve our problem. We want to figure this out, this problem that I have. Well, we, have we have a problem with our family. We have a problem at work. We have a problem with the government. We have a spiritual problem. We want to solve it. 
But our mind, our psyche, our soul is trapped within a lot of laws. That's why it is so difficult to get out of it. So if you studied any of the mythology, Greco-Roman mythology, you would know about um, being in the labyrinth, the catacomb with a minotaur in it, and being in a maze, trying to get out of that maze. And you, everywhere you turn is just more maze, more confusion, not sure what's right or what's wrong, what's going on. It's because our soul, our psyche, is trapped within a lot of laws. Let's go to the Trito Cosmos, or the Inferno. So, we have psychological elements which are very heavy. That's, you see that outcome in this society. We're, you just look at the news. Just look at any of, any of the crumbling institutions that we have around the world. There's, there's a lot of scary things and difficult things going on in the world. A lot of problems which should be solvable, but they're just not because we all possess this ego. But it's, it's one thing to acknowledge that we have an ego. It's another thing to actually comprehend it and liberate oneself from those laws. This slide here, the density of the atoms of the cosmos, is just a pictorial... Um, explanation of what I just spoke about. It's something relative. It's not something to take as absolute, like this is the way it looks. In reality, this is a depiction of what one law or one principle would look like in relationship to 48, to 3, to 6, to 12, and 24, to 48. So you can see the one law become the three become very nice and it's enveloped. And then the three becomes six and the six become 12. And by the time we get to 48, every activity, every movement of that intelligence is limited by 48 factors, we could say. So that intelligence works in a very mechanical way. There's something that we get out of that, though. There's something that we... Um, must leverage out of this idea of, of being in a heavier world. Why is it necessary to create such a mechanistic world? Why does the divine create it like this? Why, why have a heaven and then an earth, so to speak? And the reality is, is that the different laws provide a capacity for this one united intelligence to see itself in different ways. If the, if the one united intelligence separates itself and divides itself into many ways, it interacts with itself in many ways. If you look into yourself, you'll find your own inner contradictions. You'll find where you are contradicting yourself. You will find your own inner hypocrisy. Right? And that conflict is what that inner conflict breeds external conflict. So I'm frustrated with myself and I end up having an argument with someone else. It's a very simple type of thing. If we were to look at that in a very lazy way, we would say, well, that person was just being a jerk that day. Or, our, or we could even say, well, I was just in a bad mood that day. But there's something a lot deeper. That... Um, Conflict, any problem that we're having, you can almost think of it as, you know, uh, an anvil hitting the iron or some phenomenon creating that sound. That's a quality. If you observe it, if you see the way that you interact with the world, that gives a spark of light. In the same way that anvil comes down, hits, hits the iron, what happens? A spark. Why does a spark appear? Do you know why? Because there's impurities in the iron. They're trying to get the impurities out. As you, you hit that iron again and again, you, get, you hammer out the impurities. But we have to take advantage of that. We have to not just repudiate and not want to look at our conflict. We actually have to go into it. Not to justify it, 
Not to condemn it, but to actually understand why am I doing it? Why is this happening to me? If you don't, you will repeat it. When you do that for many decades, you won't get anywhere by the time you're by the time your body runs out of energy. So we've talked about all the up to 48 laws, but there are, I said it before, there's up to 864 laws. Why is that? Well, there's the final cosmos, which is, if, we, if we're going from the external world, we went down to the planet and then the human being, and then we, call with, we have the atomic inferno. There's a relationship with the interior of this world, but not the physical interior of this world another dimension. In the same way that the superior dimensions are related to heaven or to nirvana, there's inferior dimensions as well. When do we, ex we experience those inferior dimensions all the time? When we're seeing red with anger. When we have a bad dream. When we have a nightmare. When you're being chased by someone. You're experiencing very heavy energy. And it's frightening. Our own ego is that. So in this final cosmos, the Trito cosmos, we have the entire tree of life inverted as a shadow. So we have that within ourselves. Every creation has that shadow within ourselves. It's one thing to have it. It's another thing for it to be full of that energy. And we're full of all this heavy energy. So in that final condensation of energy, every one of these sephiroth it goes from 48 to 96, and then 96 gets multiplied by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Which, from an alchemical standpoint, we can relate to the different worlds. We could get very Kabbalistic about that and uh, talk quite a bit. We're not going to get into that. We're just going to say that there is a relationship there. And those planetary symbols or arcana, we could say, have a relationship to our psyche as well. So mechanicity gets quite complicated. We're all vibrating with very heavy energy, and that's why we're having problems. Not just us personally, but I'm talking about this world, the society. We are vibrating with so much heavy energy that we're actually pulling up this heavy energy and it's kind of manifesting physically. In the same way that I said before, when you, have a, when you have a conflict psychologically, the inner conflict breeds outer conflict. A very naive sense, we like to think other people are causing us problems. But what's a problem for one person is the same set of circumstances is not a problem for that other person. So it's not the external circumstances, it's our nature within ourselves. Our nature within ourselves is very complicated. So we find problems with everything. So as, just as we individually cause problems in our life because of our state of our mind, as a society, because of all the problems that we have, we start making a whole society and cultures which are causing problems. So it's not just one other, some other group or some other person that's causing problems and we need to point our finger at them and get rid of them. You know, that's a very... Uh, dangerous and unuseful way of, of dealing with our problems. But we can see that that's happening, unfortunately. So we have to know how do we get out of this mess? How do we get out of the, the maze that we're in? And how does our mechanicity relate to our divine intelligence? We have a physical body, we have emotions and intellect, we have willpower, we have the capacity or the desire to act as well. And, then, and when we get to that level, then we also have what I said before, our discernment and our capacity to perceive. Right? So you have your perception, your discernment, and your, and your desire or your willpower to act, right? These are the very core principles of what we are. If we could get to that, we would know what it would be to be, have an experience with liberated consciousness. How do we get to that? 
That's what we call the science of awakening. So there was factors that put us into our current state, and there are factors which can liberate us from that state. There's a lot of ways that we talk about in many different lectures, how do we awaken? How do we transform ourselves? In two prior lectures that were part of this series, we talked about the transformation of impressions, and we talked about uh, self-observation. The, the word mindfulness is becoming quite popular today, and that's good. That's very good. We need that. We need to become mindful. We need to learn how to be present from moment to moment. This is a foundational level of teaching, the mindfulness. You can't really skip it, but it also is foundational. Having mindfulness as a means to an end is very limited. You can be very mindful of your, of your life, but you also need to have a direction, a path to change yourself. Mindfulness itself will give you the facts, will give you the reality. It will also train your consciousness, train yourself to be able to be present. Because without mindfulness, we're just, as we're just asleep, we're not paying attention. So this very common experience of reflecting on the last five or ten years and the Experience arrives in you and says, I can't believe how fast the time has gone by. What is that? What does that mean? What's, what's the source of that? I can't believe how fast this time has gone by. I can't believe that was 10 years ago. Right? And then, unfortunately, that experience repeats itself and it's, I can't believe that was 20 years ago. I can't believe that was 30 years ago. That's not because time is going faster. It's because our mind is becoming more mechanized. It's because we are finding ourselves with less perception. We're less mindful. As we, as we become, as our life becomes more and more mechanized, we become more and more asleep, and the routine just repeats itself. And it feels like it repeats itself faster and faster and faster and faster. And it's almost as if time is speeding up the, the most when we want it to slow down the most. You know, when you're young, you, you can't wait to get older. When you're old, you wish you were so much younger. So that type of experience is the, the, is the outcome of not being mindful, of not being present, not being aware, not being here and now. So we're, we're waiting for the next thing. When you have that, that concept of waiting for the next thing, that could be the next project at work, to complete. There's always another deadline. And because we're fascinated with that, because we want to prove ourselves, or because we want to prove something to the boss, or because we want to prove something to our family, we want to achieve, 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 achieve. We're waiting for the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. We might climb the top of that ladder, but then we have that feeling, where did all the time go? You weren't present. You were, always, you were, always, you were never present. You're always waiting for the future. That's, that's what it is. And we get in the car, and we can't wait to be out of the car. We want to get to our destination. We get to the destination. Well, what does the programming of our mind say? Well, now I, gotta, I can't wait for the next thing. The sh you know, we have a plethora of uh, uh, entertainment. We just put ourselves in front of the screen. And the show ends. We can't wait for the next one. The weekend ends. We can't wait for the next weekend. The vacation ends. Oh, I can't believe the vacation's over already. I can't wait for the next one. There's, there's a, a poison in there. There's a disease in there. That's our disease. We're not being present. We're losing out on our life. But, it's, it's, but why? We know that we might identify and say that's very true, but it's so easy to get lost and just waiting for the next thing. It's because we're fascinated with something. We're fascinated with that next step. Like I said, that fascination may be because we want to prove something to ourselves or because we want more money or something. There's something else that's driving us. We're fascinated with whatever that drive is. We don't reflect and look 
well, if I continue to follow this drive, you know, last time I completed something, it didn't make me happy. I got some, some kind of contentment, but it went away. If we never reflect on that, we just repeat it, and we go on into our grave. It's not to say that you need to abandon everything, but we need to know why we're doing what we're doing. Right? Because sometimes the first reaction to the statements that I'm making is, oh, well, I should just abandon everything. I shouldn't have a career, and I shouldn't do this, and I shouldn't do that. That's, the, that's, that's, just, that's not understanding. That's just reacting in the opposite way. That's mechanicity. Instead of, instead of going this way, you just revert and turn away. You don't actually understand what you're driven. Why are you driven to do the things that you do every day? If you don't go into that, you're not liberating yourself from your own mechanicity. And it's very, it's very subtle, and it's, it's difficult. It's wrong to simply say, well, I shouldn't be doing that, but I see myself doing that, and then you recriminate yourself for doing it. Oh, so I'm hopeless, or it's, just, uh, it's worthless, it's too hard. All of that is an evasion from actually understanding it. You find yourself doing it, don't recriminate yourself. Don't justify it. Don't repress it. Don't hide from it. Don't ignore it. Contemplate. Reflect. Reflect. Right? Reflection. What is that? If I see my reflection in a mirror, it's a, it's a phenomenon of luminosity. It's a phenomenon of light. But internally, there's something very similar. Like I said before, the microcosmos and macrocosmos. There's the capacity for us to reflect the light within ourselves, to see ourselves. And that's how you get to know yourself. You get to know yourself, then you can liberate yourself from those laws. Psychological laws. So, there's something called our cosmic duty, which has this very uh, esoteric sounding word, the being part glog duty. It means our cosmic duty. What are we here for? What are we here to do? Because I can tell you you're not here to just make money. I'm, I'm telling you you're not here just to experience every possible sensation that you can. All right? I'm going to be here. I'm just going to do everything I possibly can. I'm going to experience everything, and then I'll die. If that suits you, I'm not saying you're going to do it, but I'm saying that's not your cosmic duty. Cosmic duty is to return with consciousness back to those three laws, back to that one law. So first it's from 48 to 24, from 24 to 12, from 12 to 6, from 6 to 3. That's the work of self-realization. That's our cosmic duty, to know ourselves. We relate that duty with how we practically experience from moment to moment. And again, in previous lectures we talked about what we call our three brains, or three nervous systems. Intellectual, emotional, and motor, instinctive, sexual brain. The word brain sounds weird to people, but a brain is just a nervous system. So we we relate to the world in intellectual ways. So we have here written, do not allow intellectual concepts to pass through our mind in a mechanical manner. In other words, we become cognizant of all the intellectual data that come into the mind. How do we become cognizant of that data? It is done by means of meditation. So if we read a book, we should meditate on it, try to comprehend it. We have bad habits related to our intellectual center. We think and think and think and think. We worry. There's the word rumination. Right? The word rumination is a relationship with chewing on something. Uh, like a, a cow ruminates its, uh, the, the, the cud that it eats or whatever, it just goes around and around and around and around and around and around and around. So our mind ruminates, our intellectual center ruminates. We don't know how to handle our thoughts. We don't know how to put that down sometimes, especially if you lay your head on the pillow. What happens? Does the mind start to think and it can't, can't stop thinking? We don't, have, we don't have the capacity to make it stop. It's acting mechanically. Likewise, we have all these impressions, all this information. We're in a world, an era of information, instantaneous information about just about anything. We 
need to become cognizant of all the things that we're taking in. If it's not conscious, then it's just kind of being disordered, um, randomly dis deposited into our subconscious in, in a disorderly fashion. So if we're trying to change ourselves, if we're trying to achieve a spiritual work, we need to do more than just haphazardly read things. Click here, read there, do this. You can get somewhere by doing that, but if you're, if you're serious, you have, to, you have to start to meditate. You have to, you have to actually study. You actually have to put work in and understand the things that you're putting into your intellect. In, intellect. Because if you leave things in the intellect, you forget them. They don't become a part of your soul. They don't become conscious. So we have to make sure that we're using our intellectual center appropriately. Don't waste energy through the intellect. There's a lot of ways we can waste energy through the intellect. We can come up with gossip. We can think about things that we know we really shouldn't be thinking about these things. We shouldn't be making this up. It's sort of, we don't know if it's true or not, but we, kind of, we can create a story and create a, a lot of problems. That's, that's an abuse of the intellectual center. It's also an abuse of the emotional center because the emotion wants to feel that. It wants to feel the gossip and the drama. It's fascinated with it. So uh, we have the intellectual center, we have the emotional center. And the advice here is we must become cognizant of all the activities of our emotional center. It is unfortunate to see how, many, how people move under the impulse of emotions in a completely mechanical manner without any control whatsoever. So we must become cognizant of all emotions. Easier said than done. The only one who can do this is the one who's completely awake. Uh, what we call a self-realized master, an awakened Buddha. The only one who knows everything about their centers. We have a lot of work to do. But we have to become mindful of it. We can easily see the emotional state of other people many times. Easy to see sometimes someone's in a very grumpy mood. But we have a lot of difficulty noticing that within ourselves. So a way that we can do that is when we, when we notice that other, somebody else is acting in a, through an emotional impulse, which is negative, we should remind ourselves, I might be in that mood right now too. Especially... If you find yourself annoyed with someone else, mechanically, we want to just see that other person as being a problem for us. We fail to, to want to understand what is it about me that has this resistance or this agitation that's in within, within me. That agitation's within me. They didn't give it to me. They're them. They could be polite or they could be unpolite or they could be in a bad mood. But someone else being in a bad mood doesn't mean you should feel agitated or hated or hatred or jealous or whatever the emotion is. We naively think they give it to us. Well, they were acting like that. I'm justified. Sure, you can justify your emotions, but you won't understand them if you justify them. If you're happy with where you're at emotionally, then you can justify them or you can ignore them. If you want to change, you have to look how you mechanically react to the world. You, have to, you, act, you can't just say, well, he was in a, she did this to me. That's another way of saying, I'm justified to feel this way. And that's not the point. The point of our cosmic duty isn't, isn't to, at the end of the day, say, I was justified in everything I did. That's not the point, right? It's about, why did I do it? Why did I have that impulse? Not even, why did I go and do something physically? Why did I have that impulse, even emotionally? which I hide from everyone else. Because you won't hide from your inner intelligence, your inner divine mother, of course, knows. <clears throat> so, um, emotions. We experience a lot of negative emotions. We can, many people would agree that something like anger, hatred, jealousy, those are negative emotions. There's also a lot of emotions which we may not perceive as being negative, but which are very mechanical within us, um, related to pride, mystical pride, 
being proud of not being proud, like it, it, it kind of can evolve or revolve into itself. Um, so I just want to make a note that with the emotional center and the intellectual center, it's not always feeling that negativity. Because if, if we know we don't want to be a hateful person, but we find ourselves with hate, well, it's easy to say, well, then I want to understand that. But there are many other times where it's much more difficult to see what's wrong because we don't have a problem with the way that we're acting. We're just totally uh, ignorant to what's really going on. We don't feel bad about the way we are because we don't see how it comes around back and hurts us. We see something as good, but actually it's bad. That's the one that's much more difficult to understand. It's easier to understand the things that we know we did wrong. I know I shouldn't have done that, but I keep doing it. I just want to know why. Okay, I'm going to meditate. I'm going to reflect on that. I'm going to pray to my inner divine mother. I'm going to seek understanding. But then there's another level, which is much more difficult, which is you didn't realize you were doing anything wrong. Why? We didn't have an inner... We, the, the connection there was, was, was further away from our inner intelligence. That was a more mechanical area of our, of our psyche. It's more laws. So the light or that direct understanding is even further away and it's harder to understand it. It's much deeper. Those are the ones that really keep us suffering. The, the first type where you know you're doing something wrong and you want to stop doing it, a lot of people can, can figure out some of that stuff just by talking it out. Talking through it. Having someone to listen to you. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But there's a, a very limited area to that because the next layer is you don't, even, you don't even suspect that your actions are causing a problem for you. You just don't see it. You can't see how you, the way you behaved caused the reaction in someone else, which now caused them to act in a way that's always getting in your way. The only way to get to that level is through meditation. You're just not going to see it unless you cultivate a special quality of mind. All right? We're, Unless you get access to a special quality of mind, you won't be able to get into that mechanicity with consciousness. So that's what meditation is for. We have many lectures on meditation that really go into it in depth. Because with meditation, you're settling the physical body, which is of 48 laws. You're settling the emotions of 24 laws. You're settling the intellect. So all of these things, if you think of like pools of water that are ravenous and then they finally settle down, there's no more energy in the physical body that's movement. Very, very subtle, very, only very slight. And then in the emotional center, perfectly peaceful. Intellectual center, perfectly peaceful of 12 laws. What's left? You have the six laws, your, your consciousness, which now that everything's very calm and relaxed and you're still awake, now you can see. But to do that takes practice. You have to actually sit down and learn how to meditate. It doesn't happen just because you want it to happen. Then we have three more uh, centers, motor, instinctual, and sexual centers. We must become self-cognizant of all our activities, of all our movements, of all our habits, and do not do anything in a mechanical manner. Um, so if you read that sentence, do not do anything in a mechanical manner. Very challenging, actually. Can you, do you know how you brush your teeth? What are you doing when you're brushing your teeth? Are you doing that mechanically? Can you do that every day with, with total mindfulness? Every action, every step that you take, can you do it with total mindfulness? We should endeavor to do it. It's incredibly transformative. There's psychology, even in our motor center, even in our instinctual center, there's something that we relate to. The way that we even move has something related to our psyche, something related to our soul. And, you know, for example, 
what would it mean if someone's tapping their foot? Well, it means they're probably agitated. But what does it mean if I'm tapping my foot? Probably means I'm agitated. What does it mean if I'm, you know, picking at my nails or, or what if I'm grinding my teeth? Or how do you know you're doing those things if you're not even mindful? You become mindful and then you notice that you're doing something like you're wringing your hands or something. Okay, why am I doing that? If you are present in the moment, you have that little thread that can pull you into the subconscious element that was active. But if you just ignore your motor center and you don't look at the way you're behaving, that moment it gets lost. So you could be at your desk at work or you could be at, in the line at the supermarket or you could be uh, driving your car or walking down the street and you notice something about the way that you're moving. And that is a clue into your state of mind. We must become lords of our instincts and subdue them. We must comprehend them in depth, integrally. And we must transmute the sexual energy. We transmute our creative energies by means of certain alchemical procedures. <clears throat> so our instincts is something that we also work with. That type of work is uh, very uh, kind of difficult to talk about. It's something that we, we just reflect on or how our instincts are working and also um, you know, really related to how we're instinctually responding. There's not a lot of intellect or even emotion it's just a very blunt reaction, uh, similar to like the fight or flight response. You, you know, if you're in a car accident or something happens and you don't think about it, you don't have feelings about it, you just instinctually respond. There's a lot of types of instinctual fear that uh, when you experience it, you have to work with it. Finally, with the sexual center, we must transmute the sexual energy. We, have, uh, we transmute creative energies by means of certain alchemical procedures. So sexual energy is the, one of those stuff wrote at the, at the bottom related to 48 laws, related uh, in Kabbalah to yesod, which is the word that means foundation. This is the foundation stone. This is the stone that um, people stumble over. Sexual energy is the 48 laws deposited within ourselves that has a direct connection to our spiritual energy. People don't want to hear this, but this is the, this is the truth. The sexual energy is very creative. It is where we have a moment to act as a creator. It's our root creativity comes from our sexual energy. But we don't know how to use it. We just envelope it, or it is enveloped in all of our desires, and we just express it haphazardly. We feel an agitation sexually, and we just want to get rid of that agitation. So we find someone else or something else to get rid of it. Again, this isn't something to believe in or to reject. I'm telling you, if you work with that energy, it will transform you and it will transform your mind. It is a direct connection to that intelligence. So it's a very type of blunt and blind energy. It will do and it will just go out and whatever is the path of least resistance. So instinctually and sexually, we find ourselves directly attracted towards certain things, or we have very, very heavy influences sexually in our psychology to do certain things. If we do that, and we just follow that, we are subservient to it. We are blind to it. We are asleep to it. But inside that sexual energy, the reason why it's so strong is because it has a direct connection to our spirit, to our spiritual energy. If we know how to liberate the energy... And that's what sexual transmutation is. And again, we have a lot of lectures about that. <clears throat> that's something, it's not something that we believe in, it's something that you do. That's why we call it, there's a science to it. You do this, it will transform. And you can take the, take the experiment for yourself. We know that our sexual energy has certain glands related to it. We know that those glands are related to other glands. If we learn how to transform that energy and not just waste it randomly, our psyche will transform. The problem is a lot of people don't know how to do that or they, they have a lot of misinformation. But uh, 
if we just expel that energy whenever we have an agitation, you are wasting the greatest resource you have for spiritual experience. Because sexual energy is the root fuel in the same way that oil is the root fuel for gasoline. You have to go to an oil refinery, right? And you refine it. You refine it into gasoline, kerosene, different types of chains of molecules that get refined. The same way, sexual energy has the power for spiritual experience in it. And that's why you'll find all the, the sexual types of uh, protocol and religions. But the problem is they don't know what they're doing. They forgot about it. They don't really have no idea what they're doing. And that's why there's also a lot of problems in traditional religions when it comes to sex. That's a topic of another lecture that um, we will have probably next time. Now there's two more centers. So we talked about the intellectual, emotional, and the motor instinctive sexual center. The intellectual and emotional centers have a superior component to them. So they have the superior intellectual center and the superior emotional center. These are centers which our ego could never have access to, only our liberated consciousness. So if we have a dream that's very profound and we know it, it means something, it was a very, it was like a mystical experience, that would be an experience related to our superior emotional center. And the superior intellectual center is a type of objective reasoning that, doesn't have, that isn't influenced by our subjective ego. It's very highly mystical and profound and direct. We can have some experiences with those centers if we're living correctly, if we're not wasting our energy and if we're not indulging in our ego all the time, if we're meditating. We can have some activity related to the 24 laws and to the 12 laws because that's the Superior emotional is related to the 24 laws, and the superior intellectual is related to 12 laws. We can have those experiences. Those are experiences of that divine intelligence coming down into our centers, and we have a really profound, true intuition of how to be or how to ex or some experience. But if we're sitting in our ego all day and we're asleep and we're just doing whatever we want and we're just acting mechanically, we won't have the ability to have those experiences. So the quote here from Samuel on VR is, the eye exerts control upon the five inferior centers of the human machine. These five centers are the intellectual, emotional, motor, instinctual, and sexual. The eye, or ego, cannot control the two superior centers of the human being, which are the superior mind and superior emotion. If we want to dissolve the eye, we must study it through the inferior centers. We need comprehension. So that's what I've been speaking about, studying ourselves, acquiring comprehension. So normally we are vibrating with at least 96 laws, which is that inferior uh, world. Very rarely are we even experiencing uh, the 48, the 24, the 12. But we can and we should. That's our right. That's our, that's our cosmic duty as well. When we learn how to transform the energy, we learn how to... If we can learn how to live in balance here physically, meaning we are not becoming identified with this world, we stop wasting energy related to those inferior worlds. So by not being identified, meaning you're becoming present and you're becoming you're acknowledging your, your own mechanicity and how you're repeating things and you're seeing the patterns in your own life, how they're repeating. Patterns year by year, patterns day by day. Look at your day. That day is your life in miniature. So you look at your day. Did I practice something spiritual today? Did I remember my dream? Did I have the dreams that I had last night? How did I act today? Take that day and extend it, that's what your life will be if you don't change. So we want to change. I mean, hopefully we want to change because day by day we're living in uh, haziness and fog. 
if we do that change and we become balanced so that we can now learn how to solve the equation of this physical life, meaning we learn we have a profession or we have money, we have a roof over our head, we're not constantly assaulted by so many problems that we can't even get our feet on the ground and maintain consciousness. We, we have to learn how to put our feet on the ground and not be overtaken by all the waves and temptations and um, tempests of life. What ha- often happens is like this thing happens and we're totally identified with this problem and then this thing happens and we're totally identified with that problem. Like I said, then the year goes on, the decade goes on, we're just totally identified with this problem of the moment. We're not mindful of us and how what our cosmic scenario is. But if you become mindful, you, you learn how to take on all these problems of the physical world, more or less able to keep your feet on the ground and keep your balance, then you have the energy to, to devote time to spiritual practices. If you have a situation in your life where you have zero time to do spiritual practices, that says something. You need to work on reorientating your life. You need to work psychologically to orientate your life so that you have opportunity and time to practice. Because then once you're able to practice, you go to more levels. But if you have a lifestyle, constantly so many problems, you have to work very hard. Very hard. It's not simple. It doesn't take one day or one week. You might have to work on orientating your life constantly, always, year after year, so that you have more and more time to devote yourself to practices that will liberate your consciousness. But what, what turns out is that we don't really, we, part of us wants that, but the other part of us just wants to live exactly how we are. And we are very fascinated with our life, the way it is, the story that we have in our mind. Well, we're this little protagonist in this big drama. We like to live that drama as a, this type of internal movie. We don't want to just get rid of it. it. We hold too much of ourself in, in this drama. If the drama didn't happen in life, who would I be? If I don't have someone to complain about, what would I do with myself? It sounds ridiculous, but if you reflect, it won't sound so ridiculous. Having all the problems in life is a, a convenient way to just never be present with yourself. If, you just, if you're constantly having dramas in life, how convenient it is. You never have time to look at yourself. Because really, subconsciously, some of us have that factor of, I, I don't want to know who I am. You may say that you even want to, but there's another factor within yourself that's completely afraid to know that. I don't want to know if I can achieve liberation, because what if I can't? That's, that's, that's a reality that I'm, that's too scary for, you know, this is what someone, someone, you might find this. I don't want to open up that door. So, I prefer, so even though the facade is, I'm so spiritual, but the reality is, it's so terrifying to actually look into it. But of course, that seals the fate. Because we don't look into it, of course, what's going to happen is what happened yesterday. The same thing over and over. There's a lot of factors here. But uh, we say, oh, you need to learn to meditate. You need to do this. You need to transform the impressions. You need to have a spiritual practice. Yes. But there are the obstacles which prevent us from just clicking our heels and snapping our fingers, reorientating our lives to be lived the best way, and now we're happily you know, ascending through these uh, higher levels of consciousness. It's, the reason is because we're, we, we're, we have all this complication. You know, so we have one impulse to be spiritual, but we don't realize that there's another impulse that's very fascinated with living the way that I want to today. You know, I want to gossip about that other person when they do something, because they're always doing that stupid thing. It feels really good to gossip about it. Why shouldn't I do that? And I want to do that, and it feels good. That would be an ego, saying that kind of stuff. In that moment, what feels really good is just to continue the mechanicity. But we do that at our own peril, and we can only do that if we ignore what the consequence is. Because later on, we feel empty inside, we have no spiritual experience, we're lost, and we wonder why, and we beg and we plead and we pray, show me something. We ignore that when we were over in this other decision, oh, I want to do what I want to do. Well, you're wasting your energy. When you waste your energy, 
God's like, well, God says there's no energy here. I can't, I, can't, I, can't, you, I can't be experienced inside of you. There's no energy in you. You wasted it. It's gone. I gave you the energy, and you wasted it. So God ex- it comes into us through the fluidic and molecular processes of our, of our nervous system. Our cerebral spinal fluid, our whole brain and spinal column is floating in the cer- cerebral spinal fluid. That fluidity has these properties which we know how to work with ourselves, work with the energy, work with uh, transmutation. We have this molecular and fluid aspect of our nervous system that can bring the experience of God into the nervous system. But when you waste your energy however you want, it's not there. See, this is why we, we, we say that this is more than this is not just a belief. Like, you need to believe in doing this, you need to believe in doing that. You need to use your energy correctly. <clears throat> okay, so to conclude, our cosmic duty, we can say the following things about our cosmic duty. The cost of self-realization is life itself. We have to sit with ourselves and decide what do I want out of my own experience, out of my own life. What do I want? Do I want to know myself? Do I want to have that experience? It costs life itself. The cost of self-realization is life itself. That's why we're here. As a spirit we descended, as a soul we descended, put into this to know ourselves, to self-realize ourselves. It costs life itself. It was, that's, only, that's the reason why we're here. Secondly, superior laws overcome inferior laws through sacrifice. So in our previous lecture, we talked about sacrifice and transformation. We sacrifice that desire of the ego to want to do something we know we really shouldn't. We sacrifice that, we liberate energy. You liberate energy, you have more activity in those superior worlds. You experience new things. You can't acquire a new state of consciousness without leaving behind some other state of consciousness. And our mind is a hugely complicated thing. So certain parts of our mind, if you want that part of your mind to be more liberated, it has to, there's a process of death, there's a process of letting go. And finally, perform your sacred duty. Because that's the point. And what that means in general is to, is to transform the energy and to know yourself and to know your inner being. But for every one of us individually, that duty is different. Everybody has their own qualities. And that duty, when you're performing your sacred duty, you become a very brilliant individual who shines, a person who does what they do. And you can see that that's what they do. Great artists, great geniuses, you can see flashes of that. No one else did what that person did. They didn't copycat. They didn't try to be someone else. They didn't try to impress. They did what they did. So we have that capacity, but if we, if we want to come in contact with that, we have to perform our sacred duty. Okay, so do you guys have any questions? In the back? Yeah, you talk a lot about being present Yeah. The fantasy of that moment. So it's, you know, saying we're in a moment, it's, 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 it's okay, but you also have to be, all your senses have to be alert in that moment also. Yeah. So mindfulness is something that's tricky. Uh, you, to be mindful, we can be mindful when we're in, we're in our physical body and we're doing something here in the physical body, we should be mindful centrally of our senses, of our experience. 
But when we go to meditate, we rest the physical body and we actually just want to forget about it and become mindful of our own interior process. So mindfulness is just the capacity to not forget what you don't want to forget. And when we're in the physical body, we don't want to forget that we're here and now. Because when you're going into meditation, you could actually become extremely mindful of a stream of thought, of, a, of an experience, and you're following that very acutely with a lot of clarity, and, it's, and you're becoming very mindful of that, and nothing's distracting you. But you have no mindfulness of your physical body. It's gone. You don't, want, you don't want to put any of your mindfulness in the physical body. You want it totally in your mind. Now, when you're mindful of... Um, you're mindful of yourself, and then you start to daydream. You might, have a, you might have this experience of daydreaming. You're not being mindful of your physical body. You're just becoming fascinated. You, didn't in, in, you did not intend to have the daydream. The daydream starts happening. And why, do, why does the daydream happen? Why, why does it happen? Why do you start daydreaming about something? I've used this word multiple times in this lecture, fascination. You know, being the, the very uh, simple level of being fascinated at a, uh, towards a shiny object, right? But the fascination is conceptual or emotional. There's something about that concept or that emotion which fascinates us. So it pulls our attention and our mindfulness away, and then we just start this mechanical process of daydreaming about that thing. And sometimes the daydream isn't even pleasant. It's one thing to have a pleasant daydream. That's not being mindful. That's being asleep. But we daydream about things that are extremely unpleasant. Things that we're worried about. People that we're worried about. And that's not even fun. It's not even nice. That's right. Right. So like if you're really worried about something, your, your heart goes there. So the fact is, we need to become mindful of that process. So like, you do, say you're doing the dishes, we say, well, you should be mindful just in that moment doing the dishes. And then your mind or your heart wanders towards that person you're worried about. Again, don't recriminate yourself and say, well, that's bad. I need... There's a piece of something there you need to acknowledge. I'm still worried about that person. I need, I need to figure out why I can't just put it down. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I want to more of an example of what is really like animation these days, right? Like everything's so, like little anim animation, right? In terms, in terms of, you can say a culture of like, kind of, but, you know, like, but like Japan or something like that, where, you know, with characters, I mean, we're so fascinated and fantasy so prevalent these days that, you know, people are dressing as characters, right? It's just an animated world. I guess in, in response to all of the um, media that we have today, we have you know, movies, we have so many, you know, back, even 20, 30 years ago, we had a lot less channels that we could watch. Now there's all these channels and things on the internet. There's so many great TV shows everybody's fascinated with and has, has all their emotions attached to it. All these movies and people get really involved in it. used to be that uh, creative expression like that was teaching us something. You know, the, the old dramas in the, in the ancient cultures, they were trying to teach cosmic truths in drama, in a play, in an opera, in a ritual. And this was a very fertile and... Um, beautiful way of teaching the soul cosmic truths. We rarely ever see any of that in our modern media. We just see things that are fun. Um, things that are... I, I don't want to say we shouldn't have fun. That's not really what I want to say. But things that are just fascinating to us. Things that can distract us from our moment. If you're uh, living uh, in Nirvana, or if you're living in the world, superior worlds, do you think that's a boring experience? Or is it full of beauty? Why are we bored with our experience? And why do we have an incessant desire to distract ourselves from our experience? So it's not so much about trying to understand and, and just not 
become fascinated with all of our media. It's better to look at the impulse. Why do I have such an impulse to just distract myself repeatedly over and over again? What's, what's, what's going on in my life that this is the best thing I want to do for myself? It's just distract myself all the time. But there's a lot of people who, uh, you know, uh, who get very involved in being in this type of media or sports or anything else and provides a distraction. Um, but yeah, everybody is, uh, has their own uh, impulses that they want to follow. These teachings are for those who want to liberate themselves, which is not um, a very popular statement all the time. Can you talk a little bit about what it is that's occurring when somebody is watching something of animation or another story? Mm -hmm. Because they cast or project onto that the drama that previously existed and the way that they were talking about the teaching in the past, but you've seen that in in modern animation or fantasy and in film. Well, there's still um, reverberations or echoes of those cosmic principles in our fairy tales and a lot of the um, modern myths, we're creating these modern myths out of these you know, characters, superhero characters, right? The original Superman was the man who is superior, which is the enlightened man, the Buddha, the, the Christ man. But we take that and we distill it or we kind of modify it and modify it and modify it and modify it and we're left with something that part of our self or our psyche identifies with that drama, the drama of the hero, the drama of the redemption. So there's something there, but then it's that theme with a whole bunch of violence or just ways of behaving that won't actually help someone achieve you know, a spiritual experience. So it, it's, we're attracted to these stories because the drama of the hero, you know, failing and then redeeming himself. That's, that's a cosmic drama. That's the drama of the intelligence going down into the matter, becoming brutalized, becoming distorted and being trapped in hell and then liberating itself. When we see that, some representation of that in media, we respond to that. But there are beautiful ways of presenting it and then there are ways that are... Uh, the, 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 the story is co-opted in order to market or market things. So you have this beautiful story that has that kind of principle, but then we market all these things and then we fall in love with these characters or these, the, all these things and we're replacing these divine things with you know, stuffed animals and logos on our t-shirt. And we, it's our soul yearning for that some kind of cosmic connection, some grand story, but we don't know where the real story is. I don't know if that answered your question. I'm not sure if I... No, it does. It sounds like uh, the, the speed of, of it is still there, but it's sort of covered in all of this. It's masked in the violence, the 30 minutes of violence before there's an actual conversation that may arise within us, something that matters. And so if I'm... Yeah, yeah. So there may be certain principles, but it's distorted. It's been reconfigured and distorted and distorted and distorted. And there's still some basic principles, but there may be no real good content for us spiritually. It's really just something for us to, for our ego to munch on and to be distracted. Um, you know, something like uh, the big, the big thing that came out, Star Wars that came out, you know, the 30 years ago. Uh, that actually hit upon things very profound in people because intentionally it was based off of Joseph Campbell's work and Joseph Campbell had a lot of uh, connection to Krishnamurti and uh, it was just this basic idea that there's the drama of the hero and the hero experiences the inferior world and the, and the middle world and the superior world and you know, George Lucas kind of took some of those things and he put it all together and it connected with people. 
I'm not saying there's anything good or bad. I'm not making a comment about whether it's good or bad. I'm just saying that in modern media, we have that. We have to discern, is it, just because I have this connection or I'm, I'm fa- uh, identified with it is, it, is it healthy for me? Is, it really, is the content really healthy for me? Just like modern foods, like the apple looks beautiful, but you bite into it and it tastes like cardboard. There's like nothing, there's like, this is, wh- where's the actual taste? It's gone. So modern media can be like that. It can actually look very beautiful, but the taste is gone. And there might be some things here and there that there might be a positive principle somewhere. But generally speaking, it's very far and few between. My experience, at least. What we definitely can say, it's very obvious that marketing is prevalent and it works. It works very well. And all of our media is marketed to ourselves, to us. So we actually have to work very hard to know what are the impulses? Why do I want that thing? Why, why is it good for me to get that? Why should I spend more money on that again? I'm getting messages that say that I should do that all the time, but if we naively just follow into it, we really think, if I get all those things, I'll be happy. Or that other person's got the new phone, and they're, you know, they're so cool, or whatever it is. You know? uh, if we don't question ourselves, then we just follow that kind of thing. Um, certainly, it's been proven, and we know that when PR and marketing started to evolve, it evolved straight from psychoanalytic theory of the drives of sexuality and the need for want to more things. And there was a very conscious activity of people who were producing things. Well, if we sell them to it like this, we can actually make them buy more things. And it works. No question it works. It's actually the, the most uh, widely used form of psychology today is to make us buy things and to market things. That's, but that shows you, that's evidence of, our, of how sick our society is, because we could be studying the mind to, to improve ourselves. We have that as a, as a facade, but really, the real application of the psychoanalytic theory was, the, best, the most prevalent application of it was to you know, help our you know, economy grow or something like that. But that's not what our duty is. Our duty isn't to help to help this society make more things and buy more things. But we have to be careful because inevitably some of us are going to find ourselves in um, fields of marketing or advertising or you're, you're working at a place that makes some product and you, your job is dependent on selling that product or something like that. We have to know how to discern what's useful and what's not. Um, each of us has to decide on, on our own what's the right thing to do. That's the, whole, that's the whole point. Don't just listen to me and say, because so-and-so says I shouldn't do this and I should do that, and then you just mechanize that in your mind and then become a new robot. That's not the point. The point is you have to question, analyze, comprehend yourself. Um, but yeah, you look at a lot of... If you're staring at a screen a lot, you're being marketed to a lot, and you become conscious of it, become aware of it. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Amen.